Okay, now we are talking about the spine anatomy and basic radiology. So um, we are looking at the uh, spine uh, anatomy of the osseous and soft tissues, the spine, spinal cord, a little bit, and then we'll talk about some of these variants. Like, so we're talking co covering about radiological anatomy first. Yeah, okay. Mm, so radiological anatomy very clearly says that there are. 24, I think this is basic. Everybody who is in the residency must know that we have uh, sacrum is con con consisting of five uh, bony bits and uh, coccyx is four bony bits, yeah? This is how a, the sagittal MRI looks like. This is a sagittal T2, sagittal T1. This is uh, also called the scout view. Mm. Scout view at a glance gives you uh, a idea of pathology. So sometimes I do ask for scout views, especially if I'm doing a lumbar stenosis patient, I can ask for a scout view to quickly see if there is a concomitant stenosis anywhere. And if there was stenosis, then we can <clears throat> image that particular area. So same way it keeps the cost down. Similarly, you can do it for tumors as well. Okay, so there is a value of having a T1 and T2. T1 images see tumor or bony infiltration of fat replacement of the marrow better, while T2 in, uh, images will see cord compression better. Okay, mm, now uh, vertebra uh, all have basic uh, similar structure. They have an anterior vertebral body and then a posterior neural arch. And the part of the anterior vertebral body and the posterior neural arch will make the vertebral arch ring. Majority of the weight transmission takes place through the anterior vertebral, uh, anterior part of the vertebral body uh, and the disc uh, component. So we, we quickly look at it. This is more like a biomechanical um, or an anatomical picture. So it's a vertebral body, disc, vertebral body, posterior elements. The, uh, uh, the the nucleus can be, uh, the disc is divided into annulus and nucleus pulposus, yeah? Okay, now uh, this is very important. You can see the pedicle is from, this is the base of the pedicle um, or the, and then this is the root of the pedicle, body of the pedicle there. Uh, this is very important for the uh, spine surgeons. Then we have the superior and inferior Articular facet. Now, this is a typical lumbar vertebra. Mm. The anatomy of the other vertebra is also similar. I'm talking about the vertebral body here. Um, this are some borrowed slides from my radiology colleagues for radiology teaching. And I thought the, the, the quality of slides was so good that I didn't want to alter anything. So he has shown you how a vertebral body looks like from the back. Mm, from the side, from the top, mm, and anteriorly. Uh, several components enclosed. So what does to what goes to make the neural arch is usually the pedicles on both sides and lamina uh, posteriorly that uh, fuse in the midline. Um, and the anterior part is made by the anterior vertebral body. So now this gives you the mm, quick overview of the pedicle. This gives you the quick overview of where the lamina is. And I think these things are important, especially when you're operating. So um, you should be able to convert these images in your mind, synthesize them. And when you're operating, it helps you to do what you really wanted to do. Um, the, then uh, vertebral processes. Now, seven processes arise from the... Uh, vertebra, you have the uh, transverse process, which are two, then two superior inferior process, and one single spinous process, yeah? Mm. And uh, you must remember that the articular, superior and inferior articular facets make the facet joint, which are synovial joints. So this talks to you, this shows you about the, uh, the transverse process. This is a superior articular process, uh, all from this particular talk and then mm, inferior articular process, and then the single spinous process uh, projects uh, posteriorly, and it's an important 
area for muscular and ligamentous attachment here. Mm, and you can see in the uh, cervical spine, the spinous processes are bifid, bifid, um, okay. Now we can see the, this is the spinous process. Mm, okay, then mm, cervical spine, uh, the up, upper uh, uh, cervical spine um, to the skull base is a C. Uh, cervical spine and C1, C2 has definitely a different anatomy than the subaxial spine, which is C3 to C7. C3 to C7, the cervical spine has smaller vertebral body. They have a wider neural arch and relatively long spinous bifid, mm, bifid spinous processes. And the transverse foramina are the uh, foramen transversorium are the ones through which the vertebral artery passes. Now, this is a quick uh, diagram, you can see the anterior arch of C1, the posterior vertebral body, then you have the subaxial vertebral bodies, the mm, cord here, the spinous processes. I think this is basic. And the articulation in the cervical spine, as anywhere in the lumbar spine and thoracic spine, comes through the intervertebral disc and the facet joints. Now, they also Cervical spine is the only one where there is uncovertebral joint. It is not present in the thoracic and the lumbar spine. Uncovertebral joints are, these are, again, they are covered with highline cartilage and uh, is covered the, it covers the superior, uh, the lip superiorly articulates with the inferior beveled uncus of the superior vertebra. Now this one, the uncovertebral joint has an important um, importance in uh, bony nerve root comp compression. So as we are getting old, so your <clears throat> compression can be both from the discoligamentous complex and also from the uh, hypertrophic uncovertebral joints. Now <clears throat> you can see that this is a lateral picture of the cervical spine body, then this one. Mm, the, the lateral masses forming the facet joint here. And you can see that uh, the important thing here to notice that the relationship of the nerve roots in the cervical spine is more closer to the upper part of the pedicle, while in the thoracic and lumbar spine, the nerve root is snugging to the uh, lower part of the named pedicle. So, and now we can see if this was a C6 vertebra, then this is the C6 nerve root. Yeah, okay. So that's something which you have to remember. Now, this is some basics which may not be there with a lot of juniors. Okay, so now we can see that this is intervertebral joint. Then we have the uncovertebral joint is here. Now, this if this uncovertebral joint, uh, which is here, becomes hypertrophic, it can start catching the nerve root okay mm. <clears throat> now this gives you a quick picture of the c1 c2s uh, and then the uh, brachial plexus the brachial plexus is usually formed from c5 to t1 and it can be prefixed if c4 also gives a component to the brachial plexus okay now cervical spine imaging is a lateral radiograph uh, tells you about you should be able to see the C71. And if you can't see the cervical thoracic junction, then you may ask for swimmer's view. Nowadays, uh, the swimmer's view is becoming obsolete. People are going for CT scan with the multiplanar reconstructions. Yeah? And MRI definitely has its own place. Now, this one quickly gives you a lateral picture of the cervical spine. You can see that I can see the C71 junction well taken lateral radiograph and this is an oblique radiograph which shows you the neural foramen okay now um, now we have uh, to some extent here um, there we have the c2 vertebral body the c4 vertebral body we can see the uncinate process here c7 so again a quick um, recap of what it looks like on the AP radiograph. I, since these slides are available for you and they are recorded, 
So you can have a look at it in your own time, but these are very basic. I have a feeling that some of the juniors uh, who know all this anatomy may be getting bored, but um, now we can see then this particular area or between the two lateral masses is called the articular pillar. Now you can see a CT axial cut. The uncovertebral joints are here. The facet joints are here. Uh, we can see the foramen looks like this and then the vertebral artery foramen is here. We can see the degenerate discs here. Uh, okay. And then mm, the CSF and all those things on an oblique picture. You can see that we can see the um, oxygen. This is a MR oblique cut, um, sorry, a CT oblique cut. And you can see all those things which I've just shown you and the lateral um, of the uh, um, uh, picture. Now we can see an axial cut. This is a fat suppression sequence. Um, and with contrast in it. Mm, so all the vessels are highlighted. So you can see that mm, the, the, the main uh, vessel here and the jugular veins are highlighted. So this is the carotid sheath. And that may be important for you because mm, the, the, the approach to the cervical spine is usually between the carotid sheath and then the esophagus and trachea here. So that's the plane to go in. And then you have the longest coli muscle here. Okay, now atypical vertebra are C1 and C2. These are the important thing. The C1 has no spinous process. The anterior um, body is also not there and forms an anterior and a posterior arch. And both of them are joined through a lateral mass. <clears throat> and they are joined to the um, skull through the atlanto occipital joint and inferiorly with the C2 with the um, axial joint. And you have to remember the C2 has an odontoid process. So this is a picture of the atlas. This comes from Greek, Greek mythology. This is an anterior arch superior facet. I think, yeah, and then, then typically now this shows you about the C2 anatomy and how it articulates with the <laughs> So a lot, a fewer number of orthopedic surgeons do the uh, do uh, have the expertise in C1, C2 area. Mm. And if you do have, then you must know this anatomy of how the odontoid peg is held uh, snugly to the C1 vertebral arch. Yeah? Okay, and then mm, uh, we have uh, talked. you um, about hmm, some pathologies here. You can see the vertebral artery is here, vertebral artery, this is C1's uh, C2 junction. You can see that hmm, all these are highlighting to you that there is a defect in the posterior vertebral arch. Um, some of those pictures are done by my uh, uh, radiologist colleague. So anyway, C7 to L1 has the 12th thoracic vertebra. They articulate with the ribs through costal facets. And we, we have the AP lateral and the swimmer's view of the cervical thoracic area. Uh, similarly, um, the atypical thoracic vertebra are T1, T9 to T12. Uh, normally, they will have a heart-shaped body. They have a transverse process with the costal facet. And normally, long uh, and downward facing spinous processes. So the usual thing is the spinous process. So it is very, very important, especially if you're a young surgeon to be, because a lot of times we, you can do a laminectomy or spinous process excision of an inferior vertebra. So you really have to see which vertebra you are dealing with, where is the compression, and then you have to remove the overhanging spinous process sometimes in order to get to the, the, the intervertebral disc of the um, T5-6 or if your pathology was behind the body of uh, um, lamina of T5, then you actually have to get rid of the spinous process of T4 to be able to reach the lamina of T5. So that's something which you have to keep in mind. 
then we talk about you know, rib articulation these are there in your the slides i think you can approach it later not clinically as important as it was in the past um, now you can see that this is how a picture of a thoracic vertebra and how it is joined um, superior facet is there and then the uh, the articulation with the rib head is there and then now you can see that how the relationship has changed the nerve root has gone superior it's snugging to the mm, hey sorry no no hmm. Hmm. Okay, my, my, my arrow is not visible. There is something. Ah, okay. Hey, but now it's not there. I want to put the arrow on the, it uh, doesn't matter. I think I am uh, having some problem with my mouse keypad. It's very sensitive. Um, no. We want to go back to this, yeah. Just you can see that the relationship of the nerve root is close to the pedicle. This is reversed of what I showed you in the cervical spine. <laughs> okay, now this shows you where, so you, important things for you to remember that tracheal air column, the superior end plates, the vertebral bodies, pedicles, costal transfers, and all those things which I <laughs> mentioned here um, can be clearly seen. Now the thoracic spine, this is a CT reconstruction. You can see that you can see the lamina, the um, pedicle, the vertebral bodies. Um, you can see the neural foramen here, which is very clear. Superior articular facet. Mm. Um, the thoracic uh, spinous arch is again uh, made by the pedicle, the posterior part of the vertebral body and the lamina. Okay. Hmm. And this is the MRI of a thoracic spine. You can see here that the MRI of this thoracic spine does show you the um, vertebral bodies joined with the discs and then the um, overhanging spinous process, interla uh, interspinous ligaments and um, the... No, we don't. Okay. Um, just to uh, Sohel and the uh, crowd, my team wants to just move out and do something. We want to go out now. Now you can do the letter. Yeah, just give me two seconds. There's some movement in my room. Um, yeah, okay, good. Thanks. Now we can start um, continue with this. Now you can see how what the uh, spinal cord section looks like. The spinal cord section of the um, uh, the, the cervical spine has got an anterior, basically the concept is same, you have gray matter and a white matter, and then <clears throat> from the white ma gray matter, you have the anterior horn and the posterior horn and the intermediate horn, and then the, this will help you to form the motor nerve roots by the anterior horn, posterior nerve root, posterior horn will get the supply from the uh, uh, sensory uh, and the somatic and the visceral nerve roots. Again, this quickly gives you a relationship of the uh, major vessel, which is the aorta on the left side, and the artery of the adenkevix. It still has an importance in uh, uh, surgical approaches of the um, spine, especially when you're going in from anteriorly. Now, lumbar spine, quickly cover that. These are very, very important because Majority of the pathology in the human beings are still in the lumbar spine area, typically five lumbar vertebra <laughs> with uh, nodosis. Osteology anteriorly is still similar. You have the body, the pedicle in the lateral side, the articular processes. I think the lumbar spine pictures were very clearly covered. Now this is an MRI sagittal and parasagittal image, the parasagittal T1 and the sagittal T2. Mm. you can see the fat looks brighter and whiter in T1. So the right, of, right film shows. And if you want to see the parasagittal, if you want to study the, the, the 
parasagittal area, which is the exit foramen, you should rely on the T1 weighted images because the CSF sleeve finishes um, at the subarticular area. That means that means in the lateral recess. So in the root canal and extra foraminal area, there is the nerve root is surrounded by fat. So you can study it better in T1 sequences. While the CSF is present in the um, midline and in the lateral recess, and hence the pathology involving the midline, so central stenosis and lateral stenosis are better studied in T2-weighted images. Yeah, you can see this is how a cord equina looks like, and then you must know the difference. The 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 here we have the disc. I'm showing then just <clears throat> below the area is the lateral recess, then the foraminal area and extra foraminal area. I think this one is very, very important for you to understand these terminologies. You can see the arrows here show the big white arrow on the top right picture shows you the inferior facet and superior facet. And then the, on the, the other white arrow uh, shows you the, uh, shows you the um, lateral recess there, okay? And then on the top left picture, it shows that the lateral recess is open. The lower right picture shows you a increased signal in the facet joint, plus there is a ganglion cyst, which is compressing the nerve root on the, um, uh, on the right side. I hope everybody can appreciate that. You can see the, then the other picture, which is a cartoon here, it shows you the central zone, then subarticular zone, then the uh, extra, FZ stands for the foraminal zone, EFZ stands for the extra foraminal zone. So I think in an axial cut and in a sagittal and parasagittal cut, you should be able to get to these pictures by imaging. Nowadays, the imaging is so good that you can, by uh, taking the right cuts, you can study every area of the lumbar spine properly. <laughs> then we have the, uh, and we can say that the facet joints are called the zygoepiphyseal joints. Then superior facet is concave, inferior facet is convex. Transverse processes are strong and big because they have to give attachment to the psoas. Mm. Okay, and then uh, here it's an oblique picture. And in oblique picture, you can not forget the Scotty dog appearance. Now this is a picture which shows you the Scotty dog. On the number one is the snout of the Scotty dog. Two is the eye, three is the ear, four is the neck. Now, if you have a break in the pars articularis, you will find that this um, there will be the there will be an absence or lucency in the zone four. The five is the lamina. The six is the superior facet. The seven is the uh, spinous process, and then the other side mm, facet joint is the six there. Okay, mm, so now you can see the defect in the pars interarticularis. You can see the oblique picture shows a, um, a defect there. You can see that this picture shows, the middle picture shows you the L5 lysis defect with exuberant um, callus and osteopide there, while the other picture shows you less aggressive, uh, this one. So, now we can see the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, anomaly here. This is the um, what we call as the sacralized um, L5. You can see the transverse process on the left side of the L5 is forming is having a pseudoarthrosis between the ala of the sacrum in this picture. And you can see that on the CT scan as well. This could be the source of back pain. This gives you an idea of limbus vertebra. Limbus vertebra is not a fracture. It is a developmental anomaly. You can see a piece of, of bone, which is in the anterior part of the vertebral body, which is very clear. Okay, the sacrum is a triangular shaped bone. Basically, it's five 
uh, bones join together it articulates um, with the last lumbar vertebra <clears throat> Uh, through the L5 S1 intervertebral disc, then the sacrococcygeal segment, which is the coccyx, uh, which is also means the cuckoo, is because the shape of the coccyx is like a beak of a cuckoo bird. <clears throat> and the sacrum is joined to the pelvis through a sacroiliac joint. And then there could be various anatomies. So now this is a picture, which is a sacrum MR. It shows the pictures on the left, show you the T1-weighted image of the sacral leg joint. Also, then it shows you how the uh, little cuts uh, slightly behind will show you the neuroforamen. And uh, the fat suppression sequence here shows you the how the nerve root, uh, no, not, it's not the fat suppression sequence. It is actually a contrast enhanced and hence the fat is lighting up around the nerve roots. Okay, mm. so the references for this section of the talk, which I borrowed from my radiology colleague and altered it to some extent for orthopedic residents is all from here. You can have a look at it. And then we will have a quick overview of some basic imaging in orthopedics, yeah? Now, a few more slides and then we are done. We are coming up to, now the choice of, choice of this depends, choice of the imaging depends on the clinical presentation, the cost effectiveness, equipment availability. So these are very, very important. And physiologic status sometimes can decide on what imaging to do like in MRI scans, you should um, avoid all imaging, but if you have to image a lady, then probably MRI scan or ultrasound is the safest method of doing it. Uh, basic, and I've divided them into some basic and advanced um, imaging. <clears throat> basic imaging is conventional radiograph. Now there's something called EOS. I don't know whether you are aware of it, whether your country has it. Uh, we have a fair number of EOSs in our it's a French word. I dare not waste my time pronouncing it. You can get it from the Google search. What does an EOS stand for? We also require some fluoroscopy, CT, ultrasound, and MRI. These are now basic, available to everybody in every country, whether advanced or mm, less advanced. So, okay, and then have the other uh, images. CT, PET, myelograph, discography, spine angiography, bone scan, and scintigraphy. Yeah. Okay. Now let me move this. So, hell, is it okay? Can I hear you? Good. Fine. Mm, we're keeping a good speed. I think I'm covering a big amount of uh, mileage in the question session. If you want any clarification, we can go ahead and do it. Uh, so conventional radiograph, plain radiography, widely available, most frequently used, and definitely will. I've quickly given you a lateral picture of a lumbar spine. What it shows you is the disc thickness. In this case, is maintained. It is still the most cost-effective radiological investigation. You know how to read your uh, radiographs properly and take a good history with clinical examination, you in fact do not require a CT or an MRI. This was told to me by my mentor, Professor Bob Mulholland, and I tell my residents as well, I do not, I can make a diagnosis of a tumor, the level of the tumor, the amount of compression, just by plain radiography and a good history. You do not require MRI scans. MRI scan is only required for as, as a tool um, to help you to uh, do the right operation, do the right consenting for the patient, and it's a medical legally an important investigation. You cannot make your investigations on the, uh, make your diagnosis on MRI, which is now becoming a fashion because all juniors now don't take a good history, do not examine the patient. There's a no touch technique nowadays. It's uh, talk to the patient, then type it in the computer, then send them for investigation. And then the radiologist tells you this patient has 
a, a compression at L45, which could have been got by a proper examination. Okay. Uh, anyway, that is a philosophical aspect of my uh, teaching because I have noticed the deterioration in the way uh, patients are examined by the upcoming juniors. So I hope we don't lose this. And um, conventional and plain radiography is again, in, in the limb, you have an affected and unaffected limb. Uh, and hence, uh, this is important, but uh, in spine, you have only one. Now the uh, plain radiography now has been changed into a imaging, which is done through and help of, or stored in a computer and again, the advantage is that that you can magnify certain spots you can get um, uh, and then the small focal areas can be studied better now we also should know something about the stress views the common stress views used in spine are the flexion extension views there is some place for it but uh, if you study your supine radiograph and a standing radiograph appropriately Sometimes you can, there are enough papers to say stress views are not required. Now, uh, compute, computed radiography versus conventional radiography. Again, uh, there is a lot of uh, centers in Pakistan, I'm sure, are having uh, computed radiography. So that means digitization is possible. Hence, changing the contrast after taking a picture is possible, retrieving these images late at a later date far better uh, they don't get spoilt with time like the radiographic pictures again so uh, digital again all these other advanced imaging techniques can be better studied like digital subtraction radiography can be better studied by the uh, computed radiographic EOS is a low dose the radiographic technique where a patient stand in the EOS machine and you can take a full body AP and lateral. The advantage is everything is stitched together. You see how the patient stands. The It is low dose, so it is not good for studying the details of the bony anatomy. However, it gives you very good uh, study about the alignment and the 3D reconstruction is also good. They have a very good safety profile. Okay. This is an EOS machine. We have EOS available in my department. So studying the <clears throat> sagittal alignment, especially for nowadays, the fashion is about the um, degenerative scoliosis study and the, uh, the, the um, other scoliosis, which is the adolescent scoliosis. Uh, we can study them better. Alignment is be uh, studied better, <clears throat> even post-op. Uh, radiology in the children or the girls with ultra low dose radiation is very good uh, good enough to study the alignment how the implants are behaving in the post op period and yet the amount of radiation is not very much because there's enough evidence in literature that if children are screened even for scoliosis screening if you do every 6 months a whole hmm, spine radiograph there's a 15 times increased incidence of breast cancers and ovarian cancer in the girls who are exposed to mm, scoliosis screening. Um, so EOS may have an advantage there. Now, this is an important picture. Now, this all the yellow uh, uh, arrows here are the important investigations which are used in orthopedics. The, no, no, the yellow are the ones that are used in the spine. The green ones are the used in the orthopedics. And the dark green is the chest radiography, which is considered to be the baseline. You can see as compared to a chest radiography, the body CT is about, so you can see that it is at least about 10 times more radiation. So we are talking about millisieverts. Uh, chest radiography is a 0 0.025 millisievers as against 10.6. You can see it's a, not even 10 times. It is a few hundred times more in one body CT. So when you're ordering a body CT or a lumbar CT, you have to be a little more 
worry about why do you want it is it going to add to your um uh decision making process or operative process and then yes it's justified just for the heck of doing it or making a diagnosis it may not be a great idea now it gives you but even then a total body ct is far less than uh, so you can see that the uh, this is taken from some who data that the natural background radiation is 2.4 millisieverts average exposure is about mm, uh, um, 0.6 millisiever and the total uh, millisieverts annual exposure is about 3 millisieverts a year and then <clears throat> you can see that uh, um, if you look at it um one can give a, a fair amount of these what you're talking about is the sievers here millisievers and this this one is again 10.6 millisievers so again you can see that if you are going for bigger investigations in the form of ct scan um, it does give you a good amount of radiation which is more than what is the total background radiation you would ever get so again now changing from this philosophical concept of over irradiating patients if it is not required we will go on to fluoroscopy there is an importance of fluoroscopy in in spine surgery especially when you're doing discography or you're doing angiograph or you're doing a um pre-operative embolization so all these things and the advantages of fluoroscopy it is um real time and disadvantage is high dose radiation ultrasound in spine definitely has very less role it's got a limited use but it is quite sensitivity is also low and specificity is also low and it is a very very user dependent investigation myelography is an investigation which is going out of fashion but it is still a very good investigation to study the extradural compression expansion of the spinal cord intradural lesion uh, but however it may lack the um, diagnostic specificity which is provided through an mri scan now computerized ct definitely shows uh, computerized tomograph is studies the bone better soft tissue is not so well studied but if one is a bit um, uh, good about observing this you can study your uh, soft tissues also through a ct scan very well one can make out disc prolapses one can make out cord signal cord changes cord expansion by studying the ct scan properly but i think that is beyond the scope of this talk again ct scan in our case is to assess the fractured union or non-union fracture profile it can be used for studying the lysis defects of l5 now it can also be there to study the opll disc ossification oil it is not so common in pakistan as it is common in singapore and japan this opll but i was now recently reading some literature from india even from south india there is so if you want to recognize conditions then yes it is there so ossified posterior longitudinal ligament is ossification of the pll and yellow ligament is ossified ligamentum flavum they can cause cord compression or nerve root compression and hence the pathology okay so um, the disadvantage of a ct and as i said it's a high dose radiation the soft tissue characterization is not as good but if you add the contrast to a ct the the sensitivity increases up to 96 percent so contrast enhanced ct can sometimes be very very good while a non-contrast enhanced ct can only be up to 90 percent now mri is definitely the uh, cornerstone investigation now of for spinal column and it is without radiation again nobody knows the safety of mri in pregnancy we think it is safe but if you if you have no choice as i said if it is if you're guided by pathology then there are certain conditions uh, where mri 
should not be done, especially if you have pacemakers and things like that. But there are conditions, you know, relative contraindications are like pregnancy, claustrophobia, and things like that. And again, they differentiate water, fat, and soft tissues much better. Then uh, this one gives you a T1 and a T2 weighted image. You can see the CSF is much better delineated in the sagittal MRI with the T2. T1 shows less um, of the, um, the, the water. It shows, um, it paints the fat much better. Now this is a um, uh, uh, the fat suppressed sequence. On the left side, you can see that it makes the um, the water a little more brighter. The um, and then there are again some of these things that can be used for. We'll move on to the next slide. You can see that uh, T1 the fat is white, T2 fat and water is white. The, the diagnostic specificity specificity of MRI depends on the signal intensity changes in T1 and T2 weighted images, anatomic patterns of the disease and appropriate clinical, uh, this thing. So MRI um, has added features with contrast. You can do STAR, which is the fat suppression sequence, which is on the left, uh, uh, the, the, the picture here shows T1 and T2, but you can have STAR images and MRI in trauma can definitely tell you about the osseoligamentous injuries. Uh, now, the definitely the the saying which I have and which also I learned from my professor and mentor is treat the man, not the scan. So, um, most important is to tailor the investigation according to the patient's complaints, and not to tailor the patient's diagnosis and patient's problems into the scan findings. Okay. A lot of juniors are doing this. I get referrals from medical department saying that this patient is um, uh, admitted to us with C45, C4, C45, 56 cord compression. That doesn't mean anything, you know. We, the patient is not admitted with this. Patient is admitted with a physical complaint of not doing very well, frequent falls, this one. And this investigation, does it help you in solving or answering the patient's problem is the way you should deal with. Now, this referral language, which is there all over the world, I've worked in the US, I've worked in UK, I've worked in, and when I go back to the UK, I find it's the same thing. And I'm sure this trend appear exists in Pakistan as well, that the juniors say, oh, this is, uh, this is a patient with L45 compression. No, it's not. Patient has got back with leg pain, with uh, difficulty in walking or L5. And then this investigation helps me to answer the question. Now then I decide based on the scan and based on the patient's complaints, what treatment I should um, advise. I think that's the last slide and the philosophical, philosophical slide.